Schöne Grüße. Es ist eine Ehre, mit Ihnen in Kontakt zu treten und über inklusive Musikausbildung zu diskutieren. Ich werde auf Englisch präsentieren. Ich schätze Ihre Bereitschaft, sich mit diesen Inhalten in einer anderen Sprache zu beschäftigen. Please forgive me for the mispronunciation. I promise I practiced, but I am so grateful to be connecting with you virtually to discuss inclusive music education pedagogy. My name is Dr. Christopher Hansen. I currently serve as the Director of Music Education and Orchestral Activities at Seattle Pacific University in Seattle, Washington of the United States of America. I had the incredible privilege of connecting with your instructor, Beatrice McNamara, at a conference in Canada almost two years ago. I am so excited to be connecting with her again and all of you, her students, studying this important and vital concept of bringing all of our music students in an inclusive and welcoming environment to learn and experience music in incredibly rewarding ways. This truly is an opportunity for us to enhance our experiences in the classroom and appreciate the similarities of strategies and pedagogies that benefit students across the world. Thank you again and again for your time and your attention and your very clear talent and passion for music and education. And a huge thank you to your instructor for joining us in this international collaborative learning project, this COIL experiment that we have. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk about this important subject. So forgive me in advance for a very, very intense lecture. I've dubbed this an aggressive introduction to the idea of making music with diverse learners. Now, this is the title of the course that I'm currently teaching at Seattle Pacific University. And I say aggressive introduction because I am not only going to talk very quickly, but try to condense about 10 weeks worth of coursework into about a 20 to 30 minute lecture. I recognize that I'm not going to give justice to the, the breadth and depth of the content that's necessary to really garner an understanding of what inclusive music education looks like, particularly in the context of American public schools. But I do hope that this at least introduces you to some broader major concepts that we are currently studying as future music educators in the United States. And that will show, I think, some striking similarities to how you approach the same topic in Germany. So let me maximize our time together and dive right in. The very first thing that I ask my students when they enter into this course, Making Music with Diverse Learners, in which we talk about inclusive music education, is a very simple and powerful question. What are the best practices and or philosophies that we should adopt to best serve students with special needs, in our case, in the music classroom? Now, I sincerely want you to take just a moment, whether you pause the video or you're just thinking while I talk, to answer this question. What are those best practices? What are those philosophies that we need to take into the classroom with us to best serve our students with special needs? Again, pause the video or just take a brief moment to start making a list and to reflect on either the things that you've already learned or the assumptions that you've made from the teaching experiences you've already had. Hopefully you have a few things that you're thinking about. Now, as you're thinking about them, I wanna ask you a different question. Shouldn't we be doing that for all of our students? I think this is one of the big things that gets lost when we talk about inclusivity in education. The strategies that we use to serve the students that we have with special needs are strategies that are arguably beneficial to every single student in our classroom, regardless of whatever discipline we're teaching. The idea that we try to promote in the United States is inclusivity through differentiation. Differentiation is a very important topic. 
And we need to be practicing differentiation, not just for different learning modalities, but also as associated with our individual education plans that we develop through students based off of federal, state, and local laws, policies, and regulations. Students that have special needs that are designated and diagnosed through the appropriate channels deserve a free and equitable education. And we differentiate our instruction, we differentiate assessment so that those students can have the education that our laws guarantee them. But in doing so, we can very easily segregate those students. We want to create learning environments that are inclusive, particularly learning environments that welcome students to experience and practice music. So how do we find a balance? How do we meet those students exactly where they are? How do we serve them in meeting all of their designated needs? but still create an environment that is truly inclusive, that does not segregate our students physically, emotionally, intellectually, but really brings them into an environment where all of our students can learn. One of the ways that I first started addressing this question for myself was with an amazing book written by Ellen Notbaum. And she wrote this many years ago and has a few editions that are out now, but she identified 10 things that she believes students with autism want us to know. I'm gonna read through these very quickly. Number one, learning is circular. Now again, remember, this is the author telling us what she believes students with autism want us to know as educators. So she begins by saying, learning is circular. We are all both teachers and students. Learning is reciprocal. Number two, we are a team. Success depends on all of us working together. Imagine your student with autism articulating this to you as a teacher. Number three, I think differently. Remember, this is the student speaking. Teach me in a way that is meaningful to me. Again, getting back to the concept of differentiation. Number four, behavior is communication. Yours, mine, and ours. Number five, glitched, garbled, and bewildered. If we can't communicate effectively, learning cannot happen. Number six, teach the whole me. I'm much more than a set of broken or missing parts. This is how we start to push past the labels that come with special education. Number seven, be curious. Be very curious about your setting, about your resources, about your assessment, about personalities, yours and the students be curious. The students want us to be curious. Number eight, can I trust you? So much of the relationship that we build with our students, regardless of their individual needs, is based off of trust. Learning as an exercise, as a human exercise of discovery, is about trust. Number nine, believe. Believe in your students, believe in yourself, believe in the concepts that you're teaching and the philosophies in which you teach them. Lastly, number 10, teach me how to fish. See me as a capable adult and hold that vision. So these are 10 things that Ellen Notbaum says that she believes every student with autism wants us to know. But as I've already articulated, should we really restrict this just to autism? Do we have students that are on a spectrum of needs that would want us to think these same things? And aren't the 10 things that are articulated by Notbaum not something that every student should want us to think. Shouldn't we want to articulate to every student that we believe that we are both learning in the process of education, that we work together as a team, that we're allowed to think divergently, that the communication that we share, our facial expressions and body language are all a part of that learning experience, that if we're not communicating effectively, learning is not happening, that we need to be teaching the whole person, not just in silo disciplines, but the holistic idea of how our experiences gather together to create new epistemologies in our lived experience, that we should both be practicing curiosity and trust, that we have to believe in each other in the learning process, and that we should be teaching larger concepts, not just exercises, not just skills, but we need to be teaching each other how to fish, how to operate in the world more effectively. Isn't this something that everyone should have, not just our student with special needs? 
So how do we make this transition? How do we get from the idea of philosophically wanting to bring every person in the room together to learn, but still meeting the requirements that our students come into the classroom with, the unique requirements that they have to be the most effective learners and to truly experience success in our classroom? I'm glad you ask. There are so many resources. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is an example of some of the things that I explore with my students in this course, Making Music with Diverse Learners. So I'm not going to be, address, be able to address all of these books, but I do want to highlight a few of them. One of the books that we have adopted and specifically use in our course is written by Dr. Elise Sobel, an incredible practitioner who is working currently in the state of New York, but is doing all kinds of work all over the country and the world. She wrote a book entitled An, App, An Attitude and Approach for Teaching Music to Special Learners. This is an invaluable resource. Unfortunately, I'm not aware that a translation in German exists, but undoubtedly you would be able to access some of these resources and easily reach out to Dr. Sobel at New York University. And I know that she would share these with you and provide you with a platform in which you can have them translated. She gives you practical, very easy to follow guidelines and real lived experiences of her life teaching in public schools to special education populations and how that can translate into, a, again, a practical application of what it might look like for you personally. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. How did we get to this point? How did we go again from broad philosophy of practicing inclusive education through differentiation to a book that you could immediately use as a practical guide to teaching students with special needs in your classroom? So let's scale it back a little bit. I want to start where I think we all should begin, and that's understanding the concepts of teaching and learning. For all of the students that I teach, this is where we begin our coursework, this is where we begin our field of study, is really diving into the concepts of education that are going to be most affected by working with divergent learners. So I go to a book and an incredible scholar, Jackie Wiggins, entitled Teaching for Musical Understanding. I want to pull a few important quotes from that book. Specifically, I'm looking at her chapter two, which she entitled Learning, a Socio-Cultural Constructive Process. And I want to just talk about a few of these quotes and elucidate some of the concepts that she discusses and encourage you to seek this resource if it piques any of your interest. I won't try to be too pedantic and read through every slide, but I want to just facilitate a conversation and hopefully pique your interest and give you a background of what it is that I expect my students to know as they begin this exploration of inclusive music education. So at the beginning of chapter two, a few quotes that are important. Although theories of mind certainly have implications for what we need to do as teachers, they do not describe the actual teaching process. To fully understand learning and teaching, one must understand the sociocultural contexts of learning. The idea of a social constructivist vision of learning is directly tied to psychological research and perspectives, specifically Jean Piaget and of course Vygotsky. Piaget known for his learning as a constructive understanding and then Vygotsky talking about all human learning taking place within social context, the meaning between people. This could be sort of seen as an axiom that all knowledge is socially constructed. This is the social constructivist vision, right, of learning. Some of the key terms that we would think of then from a psychological perspective is inter-psychological versus intra-psychological, the group versus the individual, and of course, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Now, again, this is what I consider foundational. This is something that we need to approach the classroom with so that we can understand the human beings that we're working with from a psychological perspective, ultimately then to change our teaching strategies and pedagogy to best serve them. So what are the actual implications of Vygotsky's work on teaching? There are four that are highlighted in Wiggins text. Teachers need to recognize that a classroom is full of learners operating within their own zones of proximal development. Number two, as learners operate together, but with different levels of understanding and proficiency, they also require different levels and amounts of support. Number three, 
The teacher needs to know the nature and level of each learner's zone of proximal development reveals the role of assessment in the process of learning. Assessment processes inform teachers and learners about who has mastered the material, who still needs support, and what kinds of support might be needed, and which aspect of the subject matter still needs to be taught to all learners. Lastly, number four, teachers must understand the role of risk-taking in this process of learning. If learners do not trust a teacher or learning environment to be supportive and caring, they may choose to not enter the zone. Quote, a safe, supportive, welcoming learning environment is critical to learners' capacity to learn. Again, I don't think this is something that is unique to diverse learners. I think this is something that all human beings practice in the process of learning. Now I'm gonna go through the next few slides quickly because I am going to share this PowerPoint as a resource with you, and I hope you will take the time to read through all of them. But some of the concepts that Wiggins addresses are things like scaffolding, right? How we're actually building towards certain learning outcomes, learning as a holistic approach, and how we create school environments to nurture different learning styles and different learning activities and assessments. She also talks about learning as experiential, not necessarily sequential. And I've put an infographic here talking about the experiential learning cycle, where we encourage experience through planned activities. We then reflect on that experience to conceptualize what it is we experience in order to facilitate experiments, right? Um, thinking of new ways in which we can experience certain activities and skills that are put in front of us. So this learning cycle based as an experiential model of learning, something really powerful to consider when you're doing lesson planning and when you're thinking about the social constructivist vision of human learning, which again permeates almost every learning environment, regardless of what country you're in, regardless of what subject you're teaching. This leads Wiggins to talk about learner agency. This is something I'm personally very passionate about and a lot of my research focuses on. So I want to little, spend a little bit of time here. She says, to be willing and able to enter a learning situation, learners must have a sense of personal agency. That is, a belief in themselves, a sense that they have the capacity to engage, initiate, and intentionally influence their life circumstances. This is, of course, based heavily on the work of Albert Bandura, extraordinary American psychologist that has done extensive work on the concepts of agency and self-efficacy. I love this infographic, and of course, this is pulling from another incredible scholar, and it says, less us, more them, creating student-centered context for learning. Quote, I think it's an exaggeration, that there is a lot of truth saying that when you go to school, the trauma is that you must stop learning and you must now accept being taught. This is, of course, a quote by Seymour Papert. So big, heavy concepts. But ultimately, I want to focus here on this idea that Bandura promotes, that Wiggins is quoting, the idea that you have to believe in yourself in order to really understand your capacity to initiate and intentionally influence the circumstances in which you are learning. Think about how challenging this is for a lot of our diverse learners. Think about how challenging this is for some of our students with autism or physical or cognitive disability, or even behavioral challenges, that we've created systems in which they learn to understand themselves as deficient. Their agency intrinsically is affected they lose a sense of belief, of self-efficacy, of even autonomy, that they can independently be successful within learning environments. How do we tap into what Wiggins says, this holistic approach to learning, to encourage every student in our classroom to learn and to experience music, in our case, to the fullest potential that they bring into the classroom, not with predetermined outcomes, not with predetermined success, but with an opportunity to experience, reflect, and ultimately then learn from your reflection of those experiences. Oh, I need to click. There we go. So learner agency and teacher power is then a really important concept. The role of teacher as more knowledgeable other and the institutionalization of formal education in our society gives teachers a degree of power. In a social constructivist learning slash teaching setting, the relationship between learner and teacher is central to the process of learning. With this process, teacher's way of being and frame for interacting with learners determine the nature of this relationship. 
Power, power can rear its head even in the gentlest of classrooms when teachers unknowingly and unintentionally assert control through decisions they make during lesson and design and execution. We have to be willing to let learners be more autonomous and get our own ideas out of the way, making space for their ideas. Now I'm loosely paraphrasing Wiggins' words and I've put a page reference here if this is a resource that you wanna explore on your own. But the positionality that we hold in the classroom is so important when we start thinking about inclusivity and differentiation. I wanted to give a snapshot of what Wiggins ultimately envisions as this socially constructed environment in which we learn. And this came from 24 of her, uh, page 24 of her book. I think that this is ultimately what all of us should aspire to, if I could be so bold to project this on you. But this is the snapshot that she gives us of the, the classroom that she envisions, that she calls a social constructivist music learning community. Think about this. In your own, uh, in your own um, aspired classroom, the classroom that you would hope to be working in, she says, in a productive music learning community, individuals take responsibility for their own learning, and also for their peers. The more experience the participants have had working together, the higher the level of mutual understanding among community members. Teaching music from this perspective turns a classroom, rehearsal hall, or studio into an interactive community of learners that shares experience, thinks together, is concerned for its members, supports its members, strives together to understand more and achieve in higher levels together, and celebrates individual and shared achievement. The teacher also plays many important roles, of course, but as a member of the community, not as the one in charge. The teacher does have more experience and expertise and therefore serves as a resource, a guide, a mentor, a provider of support, even a manager. But the teacher is also a learner, learning about and from the learner's perspectives, learning from what they know about music, and learning what they need to support their learning. God, sit in that for a second. Don't you want to be in that classroom? Wouldn't you love to be that teacher with those students? Again, this is Wiggins promoting the idea of a socially constructivist music learning community. A lot of terms, quite a bit of psychological jargon, but something that allows a space in which every student is successful and students support each other, each other in an interconnected learning environment. This is the foundation of what we do in our course at SPU and what I would argue a lot of my colleagues are doing across the United States when we talk about the concepts of inclusive music education. Let me transition us a little bit into the context of exactly what's happening in the United States. Again, I want to apologize for the aggressive nature of this introduction. I'm going to move very quickly and just highlight a few major things. I want to give you some important um, landmarks of the federal laws that have been put into place in order for us to serve students with special needs in the United States. And again, I'm going to provide this PowerPoint so you have this resource accessible to you and you can hopefully spend a little more time on each slide. But for now, I just want to introduce you to some of the big concepts that I'm working with with my students. So first and foremost, a lot of what we end up studying in terms of philosophy and principles of education in the United States is directly related to the philosopher and educator John Dewey. He is considered the father of American education, and we owe so much of our current structures, both good and bad, to Dewey's work on the democratic concept of public schooling in the United States of America. Quote, all students have a place in our schools and they all deserve an education that includes music. This comes from an incredible book called Teaching Music to Students with Special Needs by Alice Hamill and Ryan Horrigan, two incredible scholars that deal with inclusive music education. What Dewey brings into the mix and why I believe they talk about him in their first chapter of their book is he talks about the significance of unequal opportunity. A few things to note. Dewey regarded public education as a crucial pillar to upholding democracy. Quote, in order to have a large numbers of values in common, all members of the group must have equitable opportunity to receive and take from others. There must be a large variety of shared undertakings and experiences. 
Otherwise, the influences which educate some into masters educate others into slaves, end quote. And this is a quote from John Dewey. The idea is the school experience for some students is vastly different from those of others. In some situations, students have more opportunities than others. Educators are now challenged to expect achievement from all students, regardless of their background or relative strength in areas of challenge. It is clear that an equity gap remains in the public education system, and this disparity affects children in poverty and certain ethnic and racial groups and students with disabilities. So let's look very briefly of special education in the 21st century. What does that look like, particularly in the United States? This book gives some really great detailed examples and vignettes with testimony and narrative from the lived experience of music educators and special education instructors in the public school setting, engaging students through learning. So in my coursework, we do a lot of work in this book specifically to talk about these narratives, this little vignette that you see that reveal these truths of what it's like to be in the classroom, navigating all these federal and state and local policies, laws, regulations, and still trying to achieve these big philosophical goals that we've set in front of ourselves of inviting every student into the classroom into the learning process. So here are some of the things that the, one of the vignettes teach us from the chapter. And again, this is coming from a teacher that's living this experience. My students require an extremely structured environment. There is no room for being ill-prepared or planning on the fly during the day. People say teachers have eyes in the back of their heads, but special education teachers must have eyes all the way around their entire heads. As you can see, special educators are, are on the difficult front line of two reform initiatives, general special education and inclusive education. So again, this is a special education teacher specifically talking about their experiences in the classroom. And again, part of my goal in introducing work like this into our own course is to try to get our prospective educators, our music teacher candidates to appreciate lived experience, right? This goes back to that experiential model of learning. We have to talk about what's going on in the classroom. We have to start garnering perspective as teacher, but also as learner to really appreciate what it is that we want to accomplish with our students. So I'm gonna go push through, through this relatively quickly. Again, you'll have the PowerPoint to be able to digest this a little slower if you choose to. Um, some of the challenges that we see in the United States specifically deals with funding and demographic issues. When we look across states and different communities that are more rural or more urban, we see a sincere uh, disparity between funding and uh, where we see lines of access and equity in terms of what services are being offered and how tax dollars are being allocated to special education services. We also see a disparity in terms of family challenges and how families are served. This particularly is evident when we look at socioeconomic status and proximity to urban versus more rural or suburban or rural um, or um, yeah, more rural uh, areas within different communities. So lots of different ways in which people are trying to engage and serve their students best and lots of perspectives to consider. When we are looking at this book in particular, it promotes what's called the label free approach. And this is the idea of trying to approach your students learning in a way in which you focus on the ability rather than the disability. And this all ties back into supporting a democracy um, in, in the learning environment, you know, a la Dewey. Educators must seek to eliminate disparities in educational opportunities for their students in order to really ensure equity and a democratic concept of what education is supposed to look like. Now we're getting into some more of the specifics. What does disability look like, particularly in the United States? This book offers six disability categories in which they are using what is IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. This is one of the federal laws that we've passed in the United States to serve 14 disability categories. Now I have those listed on the screen, but I wanna make sure I make a differentiation. The six categories that you see listed are what Hamill and Horrigan are, have suggested is a way to approach teaching special learners without these specific labels that have been designated in federal law. So they're going for a label-free approach and they use these six categories to develop certain teaching strategies within their book. The 14 strategies that you see listed are a part of the federal laws and regulations that we have to adhere to in the United States. 
So I'm providing a link here, and this is in English, but you can change the subtitles to German to talk about these 14 categories of disabilities. Now, again, this is laid out in federal law. So if you want to know more about each of these categories, you can watch this video. It's about 10 minutes long, and it does an incredible job of breaking down each one of those categories that are protected under federal law that would affect every state, every community in the country. We don't have time to watch it now, but again, that'll be embedded into the PowerPoint, and I would encourage you to be able to explore that on your own. What I do want to go into, and you can see now this is chapter two of the book, is some of the Keystone legislation. Now, again, I'm going to move terribly fast, but I just want to give you a little bit of a foundation of where we're coming from in the United States and the history that exists for us to be able to have these big philosophical conversations that we've already sort of laid out in this presentation. So a lot of what is focused on a special education within public schools and the needs of special learners or diverse learners really stems back to the civil rights movements in America rooted in the 1950s and 60s. For most of you, you've probably heard reference to this at some point, whether in context of world history or just learning about Western civilization in general and talking about the disparities that exist in the United States, particularly as it is associated with race and particularly the African-American community or black versus white issues that we are still dealing with to this day. I wanna make that very clear. The civil rights movement established incredible federal regulations, laws, and policies that deal with racial discrimination and then slowly branched out to deal with gender discrimination and discrimination of abilities and disabilities in the United States. But we are far from having solved all of our problems. I think that is painfully evident, particularly in today's culture and environment. But a lot of what we see around the laws that have been passed for special education can be directly affiliated to the work that was happening in the 50s and 60s as it came to civil rights. One of the first things we see is 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education, which overturned Plessy versus Ferguson, that had designated separate but equal the idea that black students and students of color could be educated in segregated schools as long as they had equal opportunity to resources, funding, and an education. That was found to not be the case. And so Board Brown versus the Board of Education overturned that and allowed for an integration of students in public schools. As some of you are probably aware, this did not happen right away, and we are still suffering with very entrenched and ugly political moves that have intentionally segregated students because of socioeconomic status or housing availability. So even though the schools were supposedly integrated, it took decades before we saw that come to fruition. And today we're still dealing with fallout of it being put into poor practice or intentionally segregated through other means in terms of access and socioeconomic status. Um, it's, it's very troubling to say the least. Moving into the late uh, mid 60s, we see the passing of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Now, this was the United States opportunity to take a focus and, and take a measurement of what education looked like in the country and sort of respond to that in a way to make intentional efforts of establishing standards and assessments of public schooling in the country. Believe it or not, even though we had been educating students for hundreds of yeah, over about 170 years at that point in public schools throughout the country, we had not established standards across the country. So education looked different in every state, and that was very problematic. It wasn't until the 60s that we really started to appreciate that, again, tied to the work that was done in the 50s through the civil rights movement. And we started to have very intentional conversations about making sure that every student in the country had an equal access to education and an education that was standardized and valued. This takes us into the 70s, where we start to see some more specific legislation focused on health and rehabilitation. We get the Health and Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This is a piece of legislation that helped increase equal access to facilities, services, and treatment for students with disabilities. But it talked much more broadly about 
people with disabilities and how they had access to the country in general. This is where we get uh, Section 504, which talks about free and appropriate public education for all students. I put a link here to an amazing documentary called Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution that's offered on Netflix. I highly recommend watching it. It's an extraordinary documentary. I hope you have an opportunity to look at it. Um, but this time in American history, the 60s and 70s, is where we see the majority of federal laws being put into place to provide equal access to education, to housing, to employment. Again, we have not solved all of these problems, but this is a crucial point in our country's history to start setting the foundational laws that then were put into practice that have now been upheld and or challenged discriminatory policies. So getting into 1975, just um, very close to this Health and Rehabilitation Act that we see passed, we get into Public Law 94142. This is a pivotal moment in which we start establishing specific services with students with special needs. We see the establishment of the IEP or the Individualized Education Program, which is a specific way of designating those 14 categories of disabilities and serving students equitably in public school. This then matriculates into more opportunities to focus on skills and to develop students. Um, a quote that came out of the hearings that came with this is really significant. It says, to you, the use of the arts as a teaching tool for the handicapped has long been recognized as a viable, effective way, not only of teaching special skills, but also of reaching youngsters who had otherwise been unteachable. The committee envisions that program under this bill could, could well include an arts component and indeed urges that local educational agencies include arts and programs for the handicap funded under this act. Such a program could cover both appreciation of the arts by the handicapped youngsters and the utilization of the arts as teaching tool per se. Now, when it references committee, this quote is specifically com coming from a Senate hearing, a legislative hearing in which they were passing this law. And so it's amazing for us to look all the way back to the 70s now, well over 50 years ago, in which the conversation of including the arts as a tool to serve students with special needs was fundamental to the concepts of getting federal laws in place to be able to serve students with equity. The arts were a focus at the very inception of the laws that we have in place. I am remiss to say that we don't always see this coming into practice and fully being appreciated within public schools, but the foundation is there in the history of the laws that support our students with special needs. We also serve students that we designate as gifted and talented. It is not just students with cognitive and physical, physical handicaps or impairments. We also consider students with uh, gifted and talented needs as a part of our special education population and those students that are federally protected to receive specific services. The legislation and actually the lawsuit that was brought, Jacob um, Javits uh, is is an, uh, an act that was passed in order to serve those students that we consider gifted and talented. I give a little uh, reference here to Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences. This is one of the ways in which we practice differentiation for our gifted and talented learners, but they are considered a special population in public schools that deserve differentiation. Recently, we see in the 80s, Hudson versus Rowley and Public Law 99457. This is again where we start to see more infrastructure added to better serve our students and maximize possible achievements for our students. And then, of course, in 1990, we get IDEA. This is one of the crucial and most important pieces of legislation that was passed in the country. This is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. I won't read all of this to you, but again, this sets up the infrastructure that we use today to be able to serve our students in the United States. IDEA went through many iterations. It has been time stamped. So every so many years, the legislative bodies in the United States have to revisit it and offer updates to it. We saw updates in 1997, 2002 and 2004, and then in 2006 and 2008. More recently in 2011, IDEA was then separated into two parts and we see the establishment of six principles of IDEA, which are zero reject, protection and evaluation, 
um, FAPE or Free Appropriate Public Education, LRE or Least Restrictive Environment, Procedural Safeguards, and then Parental, um, whoops, I'm gonna go back, I'm trying to move the bottom of there, there we go, Parental Participation, um, which is collaborations with parents in order to develop the services that they need for their students. So again, a lot of the legislation that we see particularly getting into the 21st century is around building more infrastructure and supports for our students. The Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990, was another really important, of legis uh, point, important legislative act that was passed to ensure access for, for, for all citizens with disabilities. And this deals well beyond education. Again, this deals with, with housing, and uh, finances and economics and employment. And so ADA has become an important aspect of how we navigate special education in public schools in terms of facilities, not just in terms of access to education, but the actual environment that students are going to be working with and the employment of teachers with disabilities. Some of the things that came out of this uh, were specifically Section 504, which was mentioned earlier, and strategies to do things like response to intervention. We also see IDEA making amendments throughout this to promote RTI, as we refer it, and develop strategies of using RTI to target students that might need support, whether or not they're receiving special education services. Then we get the infamous No Child Left Behind Act. So this was a way of standardizing education and promoting accountability. We see the use of standardized tests across our country, which has not necessarily been an effective tool. And then we got race to the top most recently under the Obama administration. This was a way of shifting the importance of standardized tests and rather penalizing schools for not measuring up to certain test scores and standards. There was a way to reward schools for performing well, although it ultimately was still tied to funding, which created a punitive element of students not performing well enough and then not getting the funding that they needed to support their education. And all of these decisions being based off of tests, which was never good. The most recent legislation that we've seen passed is called the Every Student Succeeds Act, which came in 2015. This designated specific titles in which students and teachers and students can receive and perform services. And this is what my students who are going to be entering the classroom are working under. This is an amendment to the 1965 Act that was passed and one that we again continually revisit in the country to modify to meet the newest needs in, um, in our schools. So ESSA, as we refer to it, or ESSA, also makes reference to the Common Core Standards and revitalizing standards for public education within the United States. And now we can finally see the application of this for music educators. While the specifics of legal details may sometimes be confusing in the field of special education, which continues to define itself, the most important caveat to remember is that each student with special needs is an individual child. When we consider the seemingly cavernous world of acronyms and definitions, we sometimes forget that we are considering the present and future possibilities for a child. Taking a moment to remember the individual child and the lifetime ramifications of decisions we make often brings into focus the true importance of the education of students with special needs. So similarly to the previous video, this is the same YouTuber. I provide another link that talks about uh, the, the important legislation and a, a timeline that's happened within the United States. Again, you're welcome to watch this and it's easy to put on German subtitles for it if you wanna learn a little more about that history. The important thing that I wanted you to walk away from with today is that there is a relatively rich history in the United States of enacting federal laws that then mandate to states and local communities that they must be serving students with tax dollars in order to ensure a free and approachable and equitable education within the United States. So I won't uh, have time to be able to go through these slides, but I am including them in the PowerPoints so that you can appreciate. My course serves both music educators and music therapists, which some of you might be familiar with already. Um, 
so in the course that I teach, we utilize some resources to talk about the significance of music therapy and how that is a service that can be provided under federal laws and regulations. So forgive me, I told you this was aggressive introduction. I'm just going to power through these slides and just make reference to them. You're going to see them very quickly. I'm not going to have time to be able to talk about them, but I encourage you to explore them. This is where we see the use of least restrictive environment. We start to talk about collaborative possibilities for music educators and music therapists to provide services, clinical services for students. Um, we talk about the difference between mainstreaming and inclusion, uh, the roles of music educators and music therapists within special education and how they play different responsibilities within the life of our students. We talk about inclusive settings and cooperative elements of learning uh, to promote inclusivity. Uh, music education as a Ad as adaptation of how we meet our students' need within contained environments. We also talk about age-appropriate materials as well as related services of music therapy, and then ultimately the eligibility to receive music therapy services within public schools. So there is a specific assessment that can be given. There are actually a couple of them. And so in the course, we explore that. The most popular one is entitled SEMTAP, and how do you actually administer the SEMTAP so that students can receive special education services under sheltered environments within public schools. And then how would you ultimately implement that as a music therapist and or as a music educator and advocate for this to be present within your public school system. Um, a few things to consider. Music educators who work with students in an inclusive setting are in a unique position to observe individual students' responses to music. In some situations, the music educator might have to educate the IEP team about the benefits of music therapy in educational setting and help the team understand the difference between music education and music therapy. The music therapist needs to be aware of the fact that the school district or even some IEP team members might oppose the addition of music therapy as a related service for students students who receive special education services. Many times the music therapist must educate members of the team to inform them of the benefits of music therapy services on educational settings. So I reference these things to let you know that it's not that this is new, but it has not been standardized. Music educators are on the front line and we have a responsibility to educate our team at the school to understand the benefits of music therapy and the federal opportunities that exist to bring music therapists into the school to serve our students. And likewise, music therapists have to perform a lot of advocacy to be able to get into the schools and to be serving students with music therapy services. Um, I talk very briefly, or at least provide a slide referencing the book uh, that talks about how music therapists get into the public schools and what that ultimately looks like as a professional music therapist trying to operate with music educators. They are two very different um, professions. And then I offer a link to another great resources that talks more specifically about inclusive teaching and learning in the United States and a whole bunch of other resources that are available for lesson planning and music activities at different grade levels and different disciplines. This is an amazing project that's being housed through Gettysburg College and I highly recommend checking it out. You should be able to use Google Translate on the website to be able to appreciate the resources that they have. Whew. I told you it was gonna be an aggressive introduction. I apologize for speaking so quickly and only being able to touch on such important concepts, but here is what I hope you're leaving with after this introduction. A list of a bunch of resources that are available through the PowerPoint that I'm sharing with you and the live links that are embedded in the PowerPoint. Hopefully you've garnered a critical perspective of teaching, learning, practicing, and performing music philosophically and conceptually, what that ultimately looks like in the United States. I hope that you've garnered a few definitions and understandings of diverse learners and how we serve them specifically in the U.S. context, a philosophical and moral foundation for advocacy of inclusive teaching in the arts, not just what that looks like for music therapy, but more broadly, how we realize this Deweyan concept of a democratic education and how we need inclusivity to truly realize that. And lastly, I hope that this rant that I've provided for you gives you the confidence to change the world. I know that seems like a really bold claim, but with this virtual connection that we're establishing, with this COIL project that we're experimenting with, I want to empower you 
to see the work that you're doing as an opportunity to change the world. And I don't say this facetiously. I say this in the incredible words of Maxine Green. The arts, it has been said, cannot change the world, but they can change human beings who can change the world. I genuinely believe that is what we do as art educators. We are called to change the world by engaging the human beings in front of us. It is an incredible responsibility, but is one that I know through experience we are capable of achieving. I want to thank you again for your time and attention. I apologize for the brevity of this presentation, but I am so grateful to be connected with you. I hope that you are able to access these resources and translate them and appreciate all of the things that are embedded within the PowerPoint. I want to encourage you to please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. I would love to know what you think about this content. You will be engaging with my students through this process, and ultimately we will be connecting for a synchronous opportunity to engage with the topics that we're discussing through this COIL project. But outside of this, uh, this quarter or this um, you know, sort of learning that you're doing in your calendar year, I strongly encourage you to reach out and make connections and build your network of support. I am so excited to talk with you more as we progress through this project. And again, thank you for your time and your attention and your dedication to music and education.